cap Où caillou Où caillou This is Arscast Extra. Hello and welcome to another Arscast Extra as always with James from Gunner Blog. James, happy Sunday morning to you. Happy Sunday morning to you too. How are you this morning? When I asked you if we could do this mm. on a Sunday morning, you warned me that you might be hung over. Uh, yeah, I'm a little, little bit, little bit hungover. I was, I was out with, uh, not out, I was in my brother's last night for dinner. So it was a re- not a hugely late night, but slightly late night. And, you know, you got to sure. get up and do stuff on a Sunday morning, which doesn't normally include podcasting, but this is not the first time we've done this of late. So it's becoming a little bit of a habit. Um, yeah. But yeah. there you and go. And so how did you start your morning? Did you put... Um Three lines. It's coming home on your MP3 player. Pop your England shirt on and dance around the room excitedly. I, I bet you can't wait for this evening. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. Apart from also doing the blog, going out for a walk with Lana, meeting somebody who said, "Hey, are you Andrew?" And I said, "Yes." He go, "I'm listening to the Arscast right now." as I was going down the road, which was quite Spooky. strange. His name was Josh. So hello, Josh, if you're listening to this. I hope I hope Josh isn't listening to this as I come around the corner with the dog again, and he'll be like, this is fucking freaky. This is again weird. He's actually now. listening to this at your window right yeah. now. If you peer outside, there's Josh. Oh, hi, um, Josh. There you go. <laughs> um, and that was it. No, so I, I came home. I haven't really done the... Um, the three lines thing, the coming home thing, the England shirt thing. Not really, not really my scene, of course, but it is certainly yours. How are you feeling this morning? It's Sunday. Just to explain to people what's going on, we're because of your schedule and things and bits and pieces, we're recording this on the Sunday morning. And yeah. We were going to record it and then add to it tomorrow morning. But what I think we'll do is we'll do this as a, a slightly shorter, regular Arscast Extra and then tomorrow morning we will record an extra Arscast Extra to talk about the the game because obviously that is a huge thing for you and for many of our our listeners. So, you know, as a as an England fan, how are you feeling at 10:06 a.m.? Are the nerves beginning to kick in? The butterflies are they? What do butterflies do? Butterflying around your you're flapping, fl- fluttering, fl- fluttering. Uh, f- yeah, flapping. No, oh, like you that. don't like that, do you? No, no. But fluttering. Are they are they fluttering in your in your stomach? A little bit. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's not quite the same. I think as if it were Arsenal in a major final. But nevertheless, mm. you can't help but be aware of kind of the significance of the moment. And I will be at Wembley later, which I'm oh boy. very fortuitous to say. Um, I, I took a gamble and bought a ticket before they played Germany. And so the knockout rounds since then, uh, Germany, Ukraine and Denmark have had the kind of extra, um, you know, adrenaline of, yeah, yeah. Uh, have I actually, am I actually going to be out of the final? Which I am. So that's very, very, very exciting. I've never been to a, a tournament, international tournament final of any description. That's cool. Um, and to, to be there at Wembley to mm. watch England play a really good, seemingly Italy team, um, promises to be a hell of an occasion. I mean, I was there for the semi against uh, Denmark and yeah. it was a pretty extraordinary uh, atmosphere. Uh, almost, I'm not sure I've ever experienced anything quite like it because it was so partisan. And although there were a lot of Denmark fans there, you know, so it was still heavily weighted towards the England team. It was just uh, how, really amazing. How much, how much of this atmosphere do you think is... Um, in part due to what everybody has been through in the last sort of 18 months or so in terms of, um, you know, lockdowns and restrictions and life not being what we thought it was and a year of football without any fans. And now it feels like something that is uh, approaching normality. That must be playing a big part. Obviously, look, England, who have over the years, you could say, under underperformed or fallen short or just not being good enough mm-hmm. to sort of live up to the expectations that, uh, that that are built up before every major tournament that England are in. There is this <laughs> there is this thing where it's gonna this is gonna be our year, this is gonna be the tournament and you know it doesn't happen. So that coupled with um you know the the sort of release valve if you like, it must be feeding into the one thing feeding the other, I guess. 
I think the lockdown is a huge contributing factor. I mean, for most people, myself included, this is really the first kind of mass big event anyone has attended mm. in you know well over a year at this point. And you can see that there's a real uh, willingness to kind of embrace uh, the, the the atmosphere and embrace the camaraderie. Um, I think, you know, some of that is probably at the cost of sort of social distancing measures, which, you know, will, will have its own effects. But I do think people are just so elated to be at a football match and it feel like they remember football being. And I, I wonder how mm. much that will bleed into next season, you know, if when we get back into the Emirates Stadium and there's more than a handful of supporters in there or more than a very limited percentage, will we see that kind of atmosphere replicated? I I think maybe we will, certainly in the early months of the season, because there's such enormous relief and such excitement at being part of something that big again. Just being part of a crowd, you know, is yeah. such a thrill and you forget how much it, how good it feels to kind of subsume yourself into this bigger entity. Yeah, uh, is it a bit like... Join in. Yeah, is it a bit like... Um, not that you take something for granted, but when something is normal, you know, and then it's taken away, when you get it back, it's like, oh, God, I really love this, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And there's a real... I could, you know, with every goal that England have scored in this tournament and the celebrations that have followed and the, that have followed the full-time whistle, mm. you've sensed a real kind of catharsis too of people's pain and frustration that's nothing to do with football but to do with all the other things we've experienced in the last year or so. Mm. It kind of pours out of them and I think there's a real determination to kind of savour this experience. Um, and, and the thing is that's really interesting is obviously football is so tribal, um, always has been, always will be. But the success of this England team, in this country at least, is kind of bringing people together somewhat inevitably. And, you know, when 60,000 people poured out of Wembley the, the other night, or will do tonight rather at mm. 11 o'clock, whatever it is, they'll be, for better or worse, kind of on the same team. And I think after everything people have been through, there is mm. a an understandable nature to kind of come together behind something. And fortunately, thus far, I think, in fact, I think whatever happens in the final, I think Gareth Southgate's England team have sort of managed that and they deserve credit for it. And of, of course, yeah. my enjoyment of it has been amplified by the fact that I've been able to watch Bukai Saka doing so yeah. well and feel so proud of him and his contribution. I mean, when he went off against Denmark the other night, I was sat with... Spurs fans, Chelsea fans, a Derby County fan. And, you know, they all stood up mm. to, to applaud Saka yeah, from yeah. the field. And there was a kind of universal commendation of, wow, this guy is doing something really special. And as mm. an Arsenal supporter, you know, it's sort of uh, your heart skips a beat in those moments because there's a... You feel really, really proud of what he's managed to do. Yeah, it's great for him. I, I, I really feel happy for him, of course, as a, as a player and a person. It's brilliant for him to go on and, and represent England. I did like how you say when people come out of Wembley tonight at 11 o'clock. So that's your prediction. Is it extra time is, is happening for sure? <laughs> extra time and penalties. What are you, what I, I mean, I feel like it's inevitable. I feel like the, you know, the... the uh, I mean, maybe, maybe not. I don't know mm. what's going to happen in the game tonight. I really do think Italy are a good, good team. And, you know, they have players who it feels like can sort of get a goal from nothing. Mm. Chiesa, very dangerous. Insigne, very dangerous. Um, I think their midfield, uh, you know, they've got Verratti and Barella, I think are going to be a really tough test for Calvin Phillips and Declan Rice. You know, unlike anything I think they've faced in the tournament to date. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's really close. I mean, England do have the home advantage and I think that does count for for a lot. Um, and they have a, a very good defence, England, and they can score goals, as we've seen against Ukraine. But pff, it's tight. What do you think, as from a neutral perspective? From a neutral perspective, it's it's almost impossible to call, to be honest. I think you're yeah. right about the Italian midfield against Rice and, and Phillips. Um they, you know, Italy have the edge there. I think in Sterling, England have probably the player of the tournament in terms of producing a moment in a game when it's really needed. He's done that more than once. So, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of unpredictability to something happening from an England perspective is 
is really positive. Um, I, I just don't know how to call it. It is really close. I think England have got the talent to win it. And it's not often that you can say that about an England team where they've pretty much always had some good players. But in terms of the depth, in terms of the the quality of the bench, the options that Gareth Southgate has available to him, people who can come on and turn a game, he has got that. So there's literally everything in his locker, so to speak, for England to to win this tonight. On the other hand, as much as we're exposed to, you know, all the, the stories about in England, the first final since 1966, you know, because of the part of, part of the world that we live in and the media that we sort of exist in, you know, we're getting this yeah. very England-centric vibe to, to everything. Like the script has been written for England. You know, it is worth remembering that this means just as much to Italy, you know? Mm. This is a, mm. a first major final for a while. Um, you know, they are going to want to win this just as much as England do. So whatever signs they're looking at in the stars as much as England are, you know, it's going to be really, really intense. It's going to be a really intense game. From a neutral perspective, I just want to see a really good game of football. I do wonder if sometimes in finals the the occasion, the magnitude of the occasion takes something away from the spectacle. Like an early goal for one side would probably be the best thing that could happen to the game from a neutral uh, neutral perspective, you know? Yeah, I mean, maybe this is my bias showing, but I think an early goal for England would be the best thing because, you know, that will force Italy to come out and play and, mm. and it will stop them doing some of the things like eating up the clock that maybe have been less popular elements <laughs> of their play. Um, I, I mean, if to... Italy get in front, <laughs> yeah. they'll be very difficult to well, beat. They will, they will. I have to say, I think... Um, you know, the, there was a great bit on Second Captain's podcast uh, during the week. Ken Early was talking about, I think it was a Henry Winter article where he was talking about uh, England have finally developed a streetwise edge or a streetwise <laughs> mentality or whatever mm. it is. And all this focus on the Italian, in inverted commas, gamesmanship and time wasting and diving and things like that. And Ken made the great point that, like, it's almost as if they've forgotten Michael Owen versus Argentina never happened, you know. Yeah, yeah. It is, it is a matter of perspective, of course. But, you know, these are professional footballers who, um, you know, behave in ways that are designed to get the maximum impact for their teams. It's it's a, it's something both sides do, you know? England well, yeah, have look Harry, at Sterling England have, getting it, the penalty the yeah, other day. England have Harry Kane up front, who has a track record of, you know, that kind of gamesmanship that if it were, you know, a, a foreign player, they would be pilloried from, you know, one end of the media spectrum to the other, you know? So... There's no sort of moral high ground here when it comes to to that part of the game. Maybe some teams and some countries are better at it than others. And um, whether you want exactly it. whether you want to like think better is better, or if it could be worse, depending on how you view that kind of stuff. But look, I, I think you're right that uh, an early goal for England would certainly be um, good for the game. So too, though, a goal for Italy. They may sit in and they may make it difficult, but I think they're going to do that anyway. And as they as they showed against Spain, when it was 1-0 to Italy in that, that game against Spain, I kind of thought, well, look, they're just going to see it out. They're going to, you know, um, mm. defend this lead the way Italian teams can do. But Spain showed that they're vulnerable at the back. You know, mm. I know Morata scored, but didn't... Who was the guy... Or Yosabal had a really brilliant chance to score a header and completely missed the ball. So Italy, while they may be famed for their defending, I don't know that this is necessarily the most uh, brilliant Italian team from a defensive point of view. You know, So even if they score first, I don't think they're um, impenetrable to England by any means. No, that's a good point. I think you're absolutely right about the gamesmanship element. I mean, Italy are just the, the best exponents of it really I think everyone's trying to do it to an extent um, but they are kind of the masters and, and a lot of that is experience you know they've got such mm. experience in the heart of their team but yeah I think it's the right final for the tournament I think Italy have been the best team over the course of the tournament that I've seen and I think England you know uh, maybe the second best and I think they bring mm. a lot to it in terms of it being at Wembley as well so it's a terrific final Um and let's see, yeah, let's see what happens. I, I, I daren't make a prediction. I really don't know. it. Like you say, it's no. very close to call. Cool. Um, I mean, it wouldn't be a surprise if it went to extra time 
you know, this game because I think it is quite tight. So I don't think it's going to be a case that one team is going to run away with this. Maybe those are famous last words and someone will clip this piece of audio and make me look like <laughs> an idiot. <Yeah. laughs> but I, and, and England have a really strong bench. I think it would yeah. suit them in some ways if it went to extra time. If you th- look at against what happened against Denmark, yeah. being able to bring on, you know, well, Phil Foden is <laughs> Bring on Grealish point, but... and then take him off again. I mean, that's how yeah. strong the fucking bench is, you know. And I, you've got yeah. Sancho, mm. others, you know. Rashford, I mean, I think that was... I know what Denmark were trying to do, but I think they made a mistake in terms of how soon they made some of their subs. And England, I think, made one sub in the 90 yeah, minutes. Right. And, you know, Denmark wanted to add some fresh legs and what have you, but, uh, you know, it, it didn't really help. So, look, it is going to be a, a fascinating game uh, later on. And, look, we'll, we'll talk about it more in the morning. In the meantime, let's talk a bit of Arsenal. And we mm. have made our first signing of the summer. Uh, Nuno Tavares has come in from Benfica, a backup left back to Kieran Tierney. Um, I mean, nobody's going to start dancing or anything like that, but it is a position that we had to fill and we've done it. We have, yeah. And he came over to England about a week or so ago, didn't he? And he had to stay in isolation for a little period of time. Mm. Um, but now he's out and the deal's been completed. I, I think it's a really good one. I mean, it's a position that I was worried about, you know, what are they going to do? It's not an easy slot to fill. Mm. Um, And they found someone who, in terms of profile at least, fits the bill perfectly. A young, athletic left back who's capable of replicating the kind of driving runs Kieran Tierney makes into the final third. He's got the stamina, he's got the speed. Um, He's a tall guy as well, you know, competes for a lot of aerial tools. He's about six foot, I think, which that adds another dimension. Mm. Um, and crucially, he's the right age. I mean, he's you know he's he's the right age to be comfortable being an understudy to Tierney. And however the next few years go, um, we'll see what happens. But it's very hard to foresee a situation where Arsenal don't really make their money back on this guy. I mean, about eight million euros rising mm. to ten for a promising young defender who, you know, if he does well at Arsenal, will probably force himself onto the fringes of the international setup. I mean, that seems like a very good deal. Yeah, I mean. That is one of the more encouraging things about it. I don't know a great deal about him as a player. I can't sort of pretend uh, I've watched a lot of him and I know exactly what he is. I mean, if you want to know a bit more, we've got a podcast over on Patreon, myself and Phil Costa. Uh, Phil, who knows pretty much everything about every player in the world right now. (laughs) His amazing uh, knowledge, you know, gave us a lot of characteristics. So... Uh, if you want to go listen to that, patreon.com forward slash arsblog, and that's available uh, right now for you guys. But I think the the point, um, a couple of points. One, the, the age profile, it shows that, okay, we've done the Licksteiner thing. We've done the Socrates thing. We've done the Willian thing. We've, you know, we have tried in the past to find these backup players who, you know, I can see some logic in the in the the thinking, right? You bring in somebody mm-hmm. who's experienced, they can add something to the dressing room, they can, you know, help you on the training ground, help develop young players. But I don't think that over the the last few years those signings have really contributed anything genuinely worthwhile to us on the pitch. I'm not saying they've all been terrible, um you know, they've been varying degrees of, you know, performance levels. But I don't think they've done anything whatsoever to push us forward because, you know, uh, it's all well and good signing a backup player, but you still need to make progress as a team. And and these guys, I'm not saying they've been a hindrance, but they haven't helped. So, you know, to, to do it a different way, look, it's obvious that there's only two ways of doing it. You either go the veteran way or you bring in a young player who can develop and, you know, isn't going to be uh, put out by the fact he is not playing first team football week in, week out because he knows he's got Kieran Tierney ahead of him. So that that's the second way of doing it, right? And they've done it and that is a promising sign. The other thing that I think is interesting about this one is the thing you mentioned, that he can replicate what Kieran Tierney does in the attacking mm-hmm. third of the pitch because he is so influential for us in terms of how we play. And I know that when we talk about being better next season and being more creative, we think immediately about bringing in an attacking midfielder, a creative player, and those are things that are necessary as well. But being able to maintain attacking threat from the fullback positions seems like another way of 
reinforcing the little bit of strength we have in that area. So to put it another way, last season, we went from having Kieran Tierney at left back, who provides us with attacking threat in the opposition uh, final third, to Granit Xhaka, who doesn't. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like we switched off something. And, I, you know, I'm not going to relitigate this whole thing and talk about, you know, why I think that was a bad decision. But you can see why, you know, with either the benefit of hindsight or some forward thinking or whatever it is, they've said, right, if Tierney is out, we need to have somebody who can do some of the stuff that Tierney does. Maybe he's not as good defensively, but at least if we can get him forward, we can work on his defensive game on the training ground, et cetera, et cetera. He can gain experience. He's still quite young. Um, but we're not missing that component to the way we want to play. Yeah, I think that's I think that's key. Being able to have someone a player who's kind of analogous to Tierney who can step in and we can keep the same mm. shape and the same style. I also think the age profile thing is really interesting. I mean, you know, one of the names that was linked to was Ryan Bertrand and mm. I don't think he's a bad player and a club who I think most Arsenal fans consider pretty smart, Leicester City, have given him a three-year contract to go and play there. Um, Looks like that's going to happen very, very soon. And I think that option was always available. But I think the fact that Arsenal didn't take it and that they chose to go for someone younger, I think speaks to kind of a broader decision that has been made about recruitment and transfer strategy. Mm. Um, It's not that Bertrand would have been a bad signing, it's that another 30-plus player, given everything we've done until this point, Mm. would have been a bad move. Um, And I think we're seeing that reflected across all the targets, to be honest, in the window. Yeah, And I I do think that is one of the big positives of the summer because... Until quite recently, it felt like something that Arsenal was sort of willfully ignoring. Now it feels like something they're willfully trying to address. Um, and that's a big a big relief to me. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, did I have a question about this? Uh, bum, bum, bum. Maybe I did. Maybe it was on the Discord. Um, bum, 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 May bum, well bum. Have been. Yeah, it is. It comes from Zach Tays on the Discord. And we'll just do a few questions while we're going along. He says, uh, as there appears to be a clear shift in recruitment policy and perhaps strategy, pretty much every single player we've been linked with or going to sign is younger than 24. Does this buy Arteta and Edu more time for you if this coming season is a bit shaky or do we need to bounce back immediately? And again, this I think this is quite an interesting one because there is huge pressure. We know that there's huge pressure on on Mikel Arteta uh, and Edu to produce the goods this summer, but also, of course, on the pitch when next season starts. But the, you know, does it does a strategy like this buy a manager more time if it goes a little bit wrong or doesn't go quite as well as we would like, or is it a more holistic way of doing business? In that, if it goes wrong for Arteta and if results aren't good enough, it's easier to kind of bring in a new guy to work with a group of players who are of this age profile, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. Do you know where where, where would you stand? Yeah, on that? I think I think both may be true. I think holistically, mm. it's definitely healthier for the club, and I think you know it suggests that there is a kind of five year plan in place that presumably is not tied to one manager you know the Mm. the idea of having a technical director should be that if things really do go wrong for Arteta then somebody has a kind of laid out a plan that goes beyond him Mm. Um, so that that I think is definitely the case I also think that it probably will buy Arteta slightly more time than it would if he turned around and brought in a load of 28 year olds certainly yeah I I don't want to go overboard on this because I think there was such frustration at times last season that if he has a difficult start, I don't think the fact he's bought a load of players under 23, I'm not convinced it would save him. Um, But I think for some fans, it will slightly mitigate against some of the frustration and I guess impatience for this ship to be turned around. What what do you think? Look, I think... My sense, I, and I don't know this because, you know, it's who can you talk to about it that could give you that information? Um, but my sense is that they they are really backing him and there's belief in him to do what needs to be done. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. So, w- you know, whatever people's frustrations 
understandable frustrations about where we finished last season and how we finished, it does seem clear that if the club are going to give him money to buy Ben White, if they're going to give him potentially money to buy James Madison, I know I noted that the uh, the Bell was talking about the Madison situation again, which mm. is going to be an expensive, expensive transfer. If they're going to give him money to bring in whoever in midfield, whether it's Ruben Neves or somebody else, and they're going to give him money to bring in Tavares, and they're going to give him money to bring in Lokonga, and maybe there's another player that comes in as well because we still need a goalkeeper. I mean, look, I don't know what's going on with the Ramsdale thing, but you know, the fact that they're even talking about spending that much money on Aaron Ramsdale suggests that there is a, a, a very significant amount of backing that could work two ways, I suppose, um, that they might stick with him a bit longer than they should if things go wrong. But it, it does suggest maybe that they're going to have m- more patience with slower progress than maybe some fans might. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, yes, you can buy a load of young players, but if you buy six under-23 players with a total value of, I don't know, $150 million or something... You know, maybe having committed that much to a manager, as you're suggesting, they're not going to chuck him in the bin if the first few results of the season aren't right. Yeah. Um, yes, it could also sort of indicate a long-term backing from the owners, which I do think is in place. I mean, I don't think they've ever really wavered on the manager or come particularly close to it. Mm. Um, so I, I suppose the original question was, will it but will it get him any credit with fans and I think the answer is maybe a little but as always results are just absolutely king in this scenario exactly I mean look it was a situation where you know maybe a year 18 months ago we were saying well look if next season is you know a wobble there are reasons why because you know he's a rookie manager he's got to rebuild the squad you know all of that kind of stuff all those logical reasons um and people were, well, yeah, you give him time, you know, you're learning. But when you're in the midst of it, it's much less easy to uh, accept uh, what, what appears to be a exactly. performance. You know what I mean? So like you say, we can sit here and talk about how, okay, this is progression, a recruitment strategy that seeks to address some of the flaws in previous ones. Actually, just having a recruitment strategy is a step forward in itself. You know, because mm. it feels like a lot of our, our work has been done um, on the fly, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Without a lot of joined up thinking. So even that in itself, we can look at that as progress, as something that's positive. This is the way that a modern football club should operate. You know, um, have a plan, have a strategy, implement it. That's great. But like if results aren't good, nobody gives a fuck about, you know, how you're doing things because, well, maybe that's the wrong way then because results aren't good enough. So ultimately, it all boils down to to what we do on the pitch, you know? Yes, exactly. Um, Are we expecting anything else in the very near future? I mean, it feels to me like the Lokonga thing is, is pretty much done. He's in England, apparently. He's had a medical in in Belgium or the Netherlands, I think I, I read, and he's probably doing the same thing that, that Tavares did in terms of uh, isolation. Ben White now, um, well, from tomorrow, obviously, is is free and easy to complete his deal. It seems like that's the, that's the thing that's been holding that up. Not necessarily a problem with the deal itself, but you can't do it during a tournament when England are, are heading towards the final. You know, it just doesn't look right. So are you expecting... <clears throat> those two to go through? Yeah, I think there's still a little bit of a way to go on Ben White. I think um, it's it's not quite the case that the deal is done and okay. they just have to press the button. But I still think Arsenal will get their man. I mean, ultimately, they've shown real willing, both with the player and with the club, to yeah. make that deal happen at considerable expense. I, I think, you know, it would be surprising if that didn't go through. Um, Lekonga, I think, definitely will in uh, due course you know as you say he's started taking the medical test he's got to do his isolation and then the deal can be completed and I think you know Tavares and Lekonga are quite an exciting if uh, slightly unknown way to start the summer Um, you know they're players who bring youth to the squad bring potential certainly to the squad um, in positions and areas of considerable need they represent 
I think, upgrades, certainly in terms of how fans will feel about them on people like Kalasinac and, you know, uh, Sabayos or Elneny, whoever's maybe going out of the midfield. Mm. So I, I think they're, I think that they're, that's the most imminent one, Lukonga. And then I think you're right to mention White. Um, I think that's kind of where we are at the present time. I don't think there's anything else that's particularly imminent. And even the White one, I think it might mm. run. A little bit longer. Okay. Uh, in terms of outgoing, there doesn't appear to be much stirring. Obviously, now we've got three left backs in the squad. While it was yeah. already curtains for Seg Kalasinac, I think it's uh, even more curtains uh, for him. Uh, there's no place in, in, in the squad f- for him anyway, I don't think. So he's going to go. I mean, we read stories, we were, <laughs> we were chatting a little bit bit about this on, on WhatsApp about Eddie and Kedia and a few weeks ago of course we did our transfer predictions and your valuation of Eddie and Kedia it's fair to say was substantially higher than mine mm. um which is fine but what did you I, I and again I don't know if this is the 100% un- unadulterated truth but some suggestion that Arsenal rejected a 12 million pound bid from Crystal Palace for Eddie and Kedia um so I mean what, what, what's your take on that? Because to me, that sounds, assuming that we have some clauses or add-ons on that, that sounds like a very attractive deal to me. £12 million for Eddie and Kedia, who... Yeah, I suppose, I I, I mean, I, I remember I said 18 at the time, mm. and I, I still think, I, I suppose it's looking around at the market. I know Arsenal kind of have a special tax that applies to their sales where it feels like we get less for our players. But I, I think the, the fact that Eddie is English and not only is he English, he's got such an extraordinary record at England under 21 level. I do think puts a bit of a premium on him. Mm. And I think attaining a fee of 15 million or so is not unrealistic. When you look at what the likes of Rian Brewster uh, move for sure. um, or Dom Solanke or whoever. I think, I mean, I mean, the biggest obstacle, I think, is his contract situation. Well, that's I it. Think I that's mean, the biggest problem. Yeah, it's, he's got a year left yeah. on his contract, which has an impact on his value. We are in a COVID, post-COVID, mid-COVID world, whatever you want to say. It has had an impact mm-hmm. on player valuations and transfer fees, maybe not as much as people might have expected, certainly not in England anyway. But, you know, for a player um, of his age with a year left on his contract with, I think, 12, if it was 12 plus three, that seems pretty pretty reasonable to me. Yeah, I, I do wonder if add-ons will be a big feature in this window. Mm. I mean, I know they always are. The fee is usually, you know, 10 plus five or whatever it might be. But I think given the financial situation of clubs... I think there will be a, 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 well, a desire to not put up loads of cash up front yeah. and to say, well, if we achieve this and that, if we stay in the Premier League over the next five years, say, then we will pay an extra X million. Mm. Um, and I imagine that the kind of clubs that are going to be looking at Eddie, I think that's going to be particularly true. Um, you, you might be right. I mean, listen, rejecting 12 doesn't mean they would reject... 14 and who knows yeah. if that's taken place and I can't say for sure if it has or not it may just be you know the opening kind of gambits in a negotiation that ends up with a deal in a not too dissimilar ballpark yeah um, it certainly does feel like his time at Arsenal is coming to an end I mean I don't know how much you watch the return to training uh, videos that were up on the website but I was kind of looking around that group of players and thinking like I'm not sure half of you will be here when the season starts, yeah. or certainly when the transfer window is over. Yeah, look, there's there's going to be some outward movement for sure, and we all know the names, and, and we'll have to wait and see. But yeah, look, it'll be interesting to see if Palace pursue that. Um, Palace, of course, managed now by um, Patrick Vieira. So uh, yeah, we'll wait and see. Beyond that, though, there doesn't appear to be much close in terms of sorting out the futures of, you know, uh, Torreira, Maitland-Niles... Willie and yeah. those kind of players who, who we think might be on Ganduzi the way Ganduzi obviously so. got done. Yeah, Ganduzi um, got done. I, I thought an interesting development this week was the new contract for Quan Quo uh, and yeah. his promotion to the first team setup. I mean, that's um, a, a really significant milestone for him. There's been a lot of competition, I think, among young goalkeepers. They've got people like 
uh, Karl Hein and I think is it Dejan Ilyev and it feels like Arthur Conquest kind of seen off not quite seen off but certainly leading that race to be part of the first team picture moving forward and he's had a lot of um, problems in his development he's missed a lot of football so mm. for him to be doing that now and he, he speaks fantastically well I saw a brilliant interview with him on Arsenal.com he seems like a really yeah, smart yeah. together focused individual um, I'm really excited to see you know what the future might hold for him well yeah it's been a while since a homegrown goalkeeper has come through hasn't it and it's funny you mentioned Dejan Ilyev as a young goalkeeper he's 26 yeah right <laughs> feels like he's been here for, for quite some time but yeah like that was an interesting development I think they were quite specific as well when they talked about his promotion to the first yeah. team squad that Edu said we're glad to have our third goalkeeper uh, which means obviously there's a number two still on the agenda and somebody else who's who's going to come in so we'll yeah, wait and yeah, see yeah. what they do there okay look Let's take a break. I feel like there is an elephant in the room that we haven't sure. quite spoken about. An elephant in a in a warehouse. The elephant who doesn't <laughs> who doesn't get enough toilet breaks, so the elephant has to wee in a giant elephant bottle. Sure. That sure, one. sure, sure. Let's. I know exactly. Yeah, yeah. let's. A Jeff Bezos elephant <laughs> kind of type thing. All right, we'll take a break. We'll come back with your questions uh, right after this. Welcome back to the Arsecast Extra. This is part two where we answer questions that you send to us on Twitter at Gunnarblog and at Arsblog. Also on the Arsblog Discord chat server, which you get access to if you are an Arsblog member on Patreon. Now, the other day, James, I was, um, I was playing golf on Friday morning and I got a text from Lewis Ambrose, which said, oh, all or please. nothing with two crying, laughing emojis. Mm. I think, and I was like, "What? What's this? What's going on here? What's what's he talking? <laughs> what's he talking about?" So I sent him back two question marks, and then he informed me that Arsenal were taking part in the next season of Amazon's All or Nothing series, a sort of fly on the wall documentary, um, which yeah. has uh, covered Manchester City before and some other small team, supposedly in North London. Um, and uh, my game went to shit, I have to say. All the <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. It had already gone to shit, so don't worry about that. Um, so <laughs> what? Uh, before I get into a couple of questions about it, what are your thoughts on our participation in this thing? Mm. Uh, I had the same sort of stomach-flipping panic moment <laughs> as you. Yeah. Because I think we all... Um, we all have a bit of a lack of trust in Arsenal, basically, of late. And I think we fear that uh, there is a chance that they'll sort of be held up for ridicule mm. if things don't go well. Um, I must say, having reflected on it a little more, I'm slightly less anxious about it. I think there are, there are things that make me derive a bit of comfort. One is that, as much as I find Spurs amusing, I didn't really bother to watch the Spurs one. Well, me neither, because why the fuck would I watch a television programme about Spurs? Yeah. And I think I think these things are basically watched by the fans of the club and not so much by others. Did like, you... ultimately, I couldn't tell you a funny moment from the Spurs one. Well, I, the only one that I saw, and I spoke about this with, with Phil Costa on the Patreon podcast, the only yeah. one that I saw was this clip of Sky Sports News or something like that playing in the background when Jose Mourinho was in his office and, you know, it was supposed to be... Oh, he goes and turns it off. goes and turns it off. And it's absolutely staged, completely is, manufactured staged. nonsense. And that was the yeah. only bit that I saw. And I didn't watch... The Man City one either. Did you watch the Man City one? I watched bits of it when Arteta joined as research. And right. I think that's another point that makes me a little more relaxed is that Arteta has been through this process before. And if he had hated it that much, I imagine he would have made his objection clear. Yeah, I mean, there is the, the aspect to this that like, 
nobody wants to document failure, right? So no. how we view this is going to be incumbent on the way the season pans out. It could be a lovely companion piece to a season of improvement and perhaps some success, tangible success for Arsenal if we were, you know, to win the cup or something like that and, you know, make improvements and get into or at least be in the conversation for the top four, get get ourselves back into Europe. You know, if we can see some progression, it could be a nice companion piece to that. The alternative, of course, is that the the season goes poorly and things, you know, take on that kind of, um, you know, the narrative is shaped by the eventual outcome of of the season. So there is where, where the danger is. But I suppose you could say it speaks to a measure of confidence that Mikel Arteta must have in himself to produce a season that isn't going to make him and the club look like complete twats. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think that's true. I think, I, I guess part of the reason that I have some faith this will be okay. Number one, I think when it comes out, we will love it. Like I think however good or bad the season has gone, Arsenal fans, assuming they don't not wish to subscribe to Amazon on ethical grounds, which would be absolutely fair enough, will eat up this content because we know in our mm. jobs that as soon as you're able to slightly lift the curtain on how things are actually working within a football club, even if it is heavily produced, people want to know that. And I, I'll be honest, like I, I'll, you know, they, they, the clips I did see of Tottenham were of conversations between Mourinho and Danny Rose or, you know, between player and manager. Mm. And I, I'll be fascinated to yeah, but see some of those dynamics. Sure. But like, this is where I have an issue with it in the sense that let's say there's a conversation between Mikel Arteta and a player over a yeah. situation or a scenario. That conversation cannot be properly authentic mm. if the cameras are there and they know the cameras are there. And I've seen people say, well, after a while, they just get used to the cameras and they start acting normally. But I don't believe that's really the case. You know, Footballers, when they talk to each other on the pitch or when they're on the sidelines or when they're on the bench or when managers are talking, you know, they cover their mouth so nobody can, nobody can lip read. You know, there, there, is a very certain, aware. Yeah. there is a certain, maybe it's wrong or maybe it's old fashioned or maybe it's antiquated. But I think um, without wanting to compare football and the inner workings of a football club to the mafia, there is a certain amount of omerta within the game. You know what I mean? Like what happens in the dressing room stays in the dressing room. What happens on the training yeah. ground stays on the training ground. So yeah. while it would be fascinating for us to see more of what goes on, I'm not sure how authentic it is going to be because A, the players know the, the cameras are there. The, the, the show itself is going to be produced in a way which, I mean, why are Amazon making this it's so they can sell more subscriptions so people can watch it so they're going to produce a piece of entertainment this isn't like a factual documentary it's dealing in you know facts or what's going on but it's not like this is telling the true story so here's our scenario you're a player i'm Mikel arteta you're pissed off that you're not playing and i'm trying to talk to you about well you know you need to work hard or whatever it might be all you're going to get is some surface level platitude stuff from both player and manager mm. unless somebody loses their temper and they don't give a fuck about the camera anymore you know so while i think it's i understand why people want to see more while i understand people are desperate for the content i think you need to then put it in a box and say this is not truly authentic. This is a piece of entertainment. It gives us some idea of what happens and maybe how it happens. But when it comes right down to it, I don't think any player or manager is going to have a properly sensitive conversation or discussion or, or decision-making process on camera, whether it's in front of Amazon or Netflix or anyone else. I think it takes something, something away from that. If that makes I sense. think that's probably true. I, I, and as I say, I haven't really sufficiently watched the other documentaries to to be able to say how inauthentic or authentic they are. 
Um, but I think that's probably true that we have to accept that whatever we see will be a, ver- you know, a heavily a version. produced version of yeah. events. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, I still think there will be insights within it that are interesting to us as supporters. I just think that's inevitable that, you know, we'll be, you know, there might be personalities who emerge within it that we've mm. never spoken about. You sure, know, we yeah, might yeah. discover that, you know, Albert Stubenberg is this incredibly charismatic figure and he'll develop like a mad cult <laughs> following or something. I don't know. But like, yeah. um, the, the other thing that slightly relaxes me is that it, it will be, when it comes out, it will be fairly removed from the events depicted like the most irritating thing about it will be every time we have a setback next season fans of every other club are going to go can't wait can't to wait see, see that on the documentary <laughs> yeah like that's going to be annoying yeah. for a year for yeah. sure but by the time that footage actually surfaces who knows mm. we might not even have the same manager you know it's kind yeah. of a weird um so yeah i i i felt the same sense of unease but I I can't lie. I am curious. And also, I guess, in the case of Arteta, but also certain other people within the club, maybe somewhat naively, my sort of personal belief is that these people aren't completely incompetent, don't not care, that they genuinely are pretty smart, successful people trying to do their best, and that sometimes that doesn't work, and that I feel sort of hope if I had a hope for the documentary it, it would be that it would be able to I mean I guess it will make that clear because Arsenal aren't going to let it go out otherwise mm. but I think it would be interesting to kind of see that you know that yeah. the gap between our perception of why things fail and the degree to which people are working within the club to make them succeed mm. I find that gap and that sort of tension interesting and I wonder if this will help us close that a little yeah. more and, and maybe learn to trust a little bit more? I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know either. I mean, I'm curious as to what level of editorial control Arsenal have over That's what goes question. out. Like, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure that there's going to be some kind of clause which prevents Amazon putting out something that could be like truly damaging to the club itself or a particular player or a particular staff member. There has to be some consideration of that, right? But how much can the club control what goes out? I wonder as well what it's going to be like for for the players. You know, is it something they'll just forget about as the season goes on? Or are they going to be hyper, hyper aware of this? I mean, I suppose the one thing, you know, that you might say is that the timing of this is 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 questionable. You know, this isn't a case that we had a good season last season and now, you know, we're looking to build on that and we're going to, you know, shoot for the top four or, or head for the title or whatever it might be. This is a this is a low point in the modern history of the club, right? This is a fairly low point. So maybe it's a good time to document it. Maybe it's a good time to see the rebuild happening from within and to see the improvement. On the other hand, if it doesn't work or if things don't go well next season, people can label whether it's true or not. I don't think like having the Amazon cameras, let me be clear, I don't think having Amazon cameras there is going to be the difference between us having a good season and a bad season. But you open yourself up to accusations of a lack of focus or being distracted, et cetera, et cetera, by allowing something like this to go on in the background when you should be fully focused on the games, et cetera, et cetera. And again, like the reality is, you know, we're, we've got to turn up and when we go on the pitch, it's the 90 minutes and they've got to train hard and all that kind of stuff. It's not going to be the cameras that makes a difference, but you can understand why people might say this is a distraction that at this moment in time, we're maybe a bit foolish to invite. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> It's an interesting point about the the camera crew. I mean, I, I footballers probably spend a lot of their time with cameras present. You know, mm. I was watching some clips from the England camp actually the other day. Some back sort of behind the scenes stuff, and yeah. they're surprisingly at ease with it because you know I guess they're there a lot of the time. And and these Amazon guys are going to have to be embedded within the club as much as the club's own media mm. team, you know, for, for this to work. Presumably they're there travelling with the team, you know, in the dressing room. They, they must become part of the sort of, you know, part of the furniture. Um, but I do think in a year in which the club and the manager are already 
going to be under significant scrutiny. And we've talked about the added pressure of no European football, yeah. focus on the Premier League, what that might bring. This does add an, another layer and another dimension. Mm. Um, and I guess, it, like you said earlier, maybe it speaks to manage, the manager's confidence that he's prepared to invite that. Um, but, it, you know, there is a degree of risk. I mean, the, the big question really for me is like, why... Why are Arsenal doing this, do you think? what What is this about? Yeah, I mean, the, you have to look at it as something that, like if you, if you, yeah, it has to be something that's beneficial. Yeah. So it is about the marketing. It is about putting the club out there um, on one of the biggest digital platforms in the world. Um, I mean, is it know, as simple as we're not going to be in the Champions League? So we're not going to have either that exposure or that revenue. Mm. Uh, we're not even going to be in the Europa League. And therefore, this deal brings in a few million quid. Uh, I've seen the figure 10 million, 10 million. Place, but I, I mean, don't know. I mean, 10 million is 20% of Ben White. You're not doing that and you're not running the risk of of looking like an absolute car crash if things go wrong for 10 million pounds. I don't think that kind of money is sufficient to say well, this is worth it. This is why, this is the the sole reason why we're doing this. There has to be, I guess, some kind of, you know, behind the scenes marketing plan. Um, you know, people are hungry for content about their football clubs. That is, that's true. We're part of that. We're part of that. fans more than most. Yeah, you know? exactly. You know, no, but it's true. You know, the, the, the training videos, as you say, you know, which are pretty, for the most part, pretty dull you know what's the most yeah. exciting thing that happens is like someone you know in the rondo does a does a nutmeg on another player and everyone goes Ooh! you know they're exactly. not hugely exciting but people love those little uh, bits and players instagram stories and the bench cam stuff and tunnel cam stuff and whatever you know people can get they they want so i understand it from that point of view i suppose the benefit might be to yeah to 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 build the, the brand Arsenal? I mean, we had a question here from A.B. Gunnar. That's why Gunner. Spurs did it, certainly. Yeah. You know? A.B. Gunnar on the uh, Discord says, does the Amazon deal show that the Cronkies will do anything to make Arsenal more popular and appealing to the newer fan, except for either investing time and or money to improve on the pitch stuff? And, you know, this isn't to defend the Cronkies or anything like that, but the two things are not mutually exclusive. You can do this and you can invest or not invest on, on the pitch. Um, but I mean, do you envisage a a role in this for for Josh? Like, is this a way for him to demonstrate that, look, I am hands-on, I care about this club. You know, after everything that's gone on with the protest against KSE with the Daniel X stuff, mm -hmm. you know, Cronkies have said many things, but not necessarily demonstrated or backed that up with actions, if you know what I mean. So they talk about the ambition, they talk about how much they care for the club, but, you know, how do we, how, how, how much do we know um, of what they do in the background? So something like this is a way for, for Josh, as the he is the KSE man at Arsenal, to position himself as somebody who is, I, I don't know whether you say in charge or influential or even interested in what's going on and, and how it's going on in the background. I'd be amazed if it didn't involve him in some way. And the reason I say that is obviously pre-pandemic, he spent quite a lot of time in London. Um, during the pandemic, almost none. And we're coming into kind of a stage now where travel is going to be, hopefully, from around when the season kicks off, slightly more possible, slightly more feasible. And I think he will want to be seen to be on the ground mm. in London um, before all the reasons that you've outlined. And I think he is someone who has a profile in America as well. And that will give, you know, another element to this documentary um, you know, people who know him from his involvement with the NBA or whatever it might be. Uh, he's, he's a kind of a recognisable face even outside of soccer. So I think 
I think there will be a bit of positioning happening here. I think that this is a lot about positioning. I think the financial thing, we shouldn't overlook it entirely. You know, not being in the Europa League leaves a 20 million hole in the budget and this could replace half of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't say I it was think, the only reason. I mean, it's part of it, sure, but I yeah. don't think it's the, the primary driver of the decision. No. I think it's about positioning. I think it's about uh, trying to show that the club... Uh, has huge reach and mm. is, should be considered among the elite even though they're not in premium European competitions I think it's about the owners probably attempting to slightly reposition themselves and you know demonstrate to the fans the degrees which they're involved and probably about trying to change I mean I'm, we're always saying Arsenal need to change the story around the club a little bit and I wonder if yeah. literally bringing in some professionals to tell to that story, the story. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I may be better suited to doing it than people within the club. I mean, mm. from that point of view, I think it may make sense. And, you know, if they're able to tell a kind of uh, compelling, captivating story of a club at the start of a rebuild with a generation of young talent, you know, maybe Amazon can tell that story better than anyone, anyone within Arsenal. And maybe outsourcing it um, we'll see it reach a bigger audience and also resonate slightly better I mean yeah. that's that I guess must be why they're doing it because I think you're right 10 million quid it's a lot of money but not enough money to take that risk and I also think when you talk about it in that way it becomes clear that there can't really be any real risk here for Arsenal like they, they this cannot be the case that they let Amazon in the door and Amazon put out something they're not happy with I just don't think that's a possible outcome. Well, I think there is risk, you know. But, I mean, look, we could talk about the season going wrong and then Amazon is providing over the sack, uh, presiding over the sacking of a manager or documenting mm. the sacking of a manager. Maybe, maybe there's a positive in that, like, oh, how well have the club done to attract a new manager? Maybe there's a, you know, a way that a bad season could be turned into a positive... Uh, entertainment thing but I do think there is risk here for Arsenal you know it's not a case that this is going to be hugely beneficial all the way I think there could be things that are of, uh, of benefit there could also be things that are damaging you know little bits and snippets of conversations that may you know change the opinion of the fan base perception against you know discredit. or the perception yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly you know so the, it's not without risk um so let's see I mean like we said at the start, it is entirely, well, not entirely, but in a, in a big way dependent on how well or otherwise the season goes as to how we view this. Um, so fingers crossed, yeah. you know, we have a good season. I mean, that's why we want, we want a good season anyway. Um, and I think you're right to point out that this just does put a little bit more pressure on not necessarily the players, but certainly the club itself the manager, the technical director, the people that they're going to be behind the scenes with, you know, whose decisions this summer are going to play into how everything goes next season, you know? Definitely. Yeah, I'm interested to know when they'll, they'll yeah. start filming. Um, um, we had another question here, just very quickly. Let's uh, make this the last one on this. Uh, Cormay on the Discord says, will the Amazon series be an extra push to make a big signing? Like what they may have hoped o Odegaard was going to be. I mean, do you think something like this... Like if, if you know, the discussions at executive level, KSE level, you know, have been like, okay, we need to change the story, the perception of the club, how we operate, how we run things. You know, what's a good way to get people on board? Signings. People love signing. So if we make a fucking big marquee fuck off signing and we can show this on, you know, our Amazon documentary, that is a way of, like if Josh goes... Do it, Miguel. You've got my blessing to do the signing. You know, mm. it becomes like a a kind of seminal moment in, you know, I, I'm talking about this being in their own minds, by the way, not necessarily for us. But, you know, yeah. something like that, that uh, as much as yeah, part of the artifice is putting across a a point of view or putting a, a, across yourself to come out in the best possible light. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I I know what you mean, but I think I th I'm going to use the word holistically again. Um, it's cropped up a lot on this podcast, but I think mm. they'll look at the window more holistically than that. I think that actually that story of 
we grant the manager permission to make a massive signing has already that's something the Cronkies have already done, has already been told, and it didn't pan out too well. I mean, you think of Nicola Pepe, for example, um, and the vast expenditure on one player in that instance. I think that if they really want to change the story, the way they'll do that is by assembling a group of young, promising players. And that's not... I mean, listen, if they sign Ben White at £50 million, that is a vast amount of money, Mm. but... I think that if Arsenal really do want to change the story, that's the story they should be telling about putting together uh, a group, you know, of young, hungry, um, friendly, I guess, players who mm. like each other, who are going to be together for the next five years. Um, I think that's the route they should and may go down. Okay. What do you think? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah. I think if if we talk about a transfer strategy, it can't be dictated to by the fact there's going to be TV cameras there for six months or eight months or whatever amount of time it might be. But I do, I do think that there are ways of, you know, when you know that this is happening, you might behave in a slightly different way. It might influence your thinking, yeah, and it might influence just some of the decision making at the top. Um, if Everybody th- behaves differently with a camera on. Them. Of course. I mean, just put that's yourself... The, that's the fact. Put yourself in the position like you'd think, ah, oh, no, after a while it'd be fine. Um, if there was a camera following you around all day, every day, you know, what's the first thing that, you know, you're thinking of? Don't pick your nose. Never pick your nose. <laughs> you're never going to... Don't pick your nose. Just don't yeah. do it. Oh, my nose is itchy. You know, that kind of stuff. And Apart from uh, Yogi Love, who appears immune to these effects. No, he he does that for the cameras. Ah. Uh, so, yeah. That makes sense, actually. So, yeah, it is It is a case that cameras make things different. But, look, we'll wait and see. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting one way or the other, isn't it? So, Very, very interesting. Very interesting. And, and like I said, it, the discussion about it will kind of underscore mm. our season. Um, I mean, what we always come back to is it's all about the results and it's all about how we do. And this just amplifies that. Mm. Big time. Big time. Right. Do you have a question? That, we did plenty. Mm, I can do, yeah. yeah. Um, let's do a couple of quick ones because I know we, we were a little bit pressed for time. So let's do a couple of quick okay, ones. Okay, no worries. Um, oh, I, I thought this was a question. HMAA on the Discord said, if Arsenal can't get the right number 10 or number 8, do you think Saka, Smith, Rowe and Pepe is enough to get the club to January in the top six? It's a, good, I, I, it's a good question. Um, given that Saka is going to need a few weeks off at the start of the season, what else have we got in that part of the pitch currently beyond those three Willian, in terms of cover? Willian Nelson, both of whom Willock potentially Willock potentially as an eight. Um, I would s- Martinelli, of course, who could play. In yeah, the front yeah, three, yeah. Aubameyang, Lacazette. I feel like it would be missing something. I feel like it would be missing a piece. Um, yeah, I think it's good enough to be the first choice. But I still think, given that Willian sort of hasn't worked out, mm. I still think we need another option yeah, in yeah, that yeah, part yeah. of the pitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, clear the decks, as we've spoken about. But I, I would be... I would be keen to see another piece added to that, you know? And it's quite interesting to think about Saka, isn't it? Um, like, if he wasn't an Arsenal player and you were seeing him do his stuff at the the Euros and then you brought him in, you'd be like, well, this guy's going to be a first-choice player. Uh, mm. You know, put him in the team, doesn't matter really where. He can do whatever he does. Wherever he does it, it's going to be amazing. Um, so I, I, at some point, I think, you know, if you do see... Uh, and clearly he is going to be a first-team player for Arsenal. Same with Smith-Rowe. At some point, you've got to make the decision about that. Do you know what I mean? You've got to Mm. lean into it. Like, I remember... Do you remember when Arsene Wenger decided that Colo Toure was going to be our Mm centre-half alongside Saul Campbell? And I know that you know, things are different then. 
um, in terms of how stuff was disseminated and discussed by football fans because we didn't have social media and that kind of stuff. But that was a hell of a decision when you consider Colo had been this kind of utility player who'd played in midfield, he'd played wide, he'd played maybe at fullback. I can't really remember. Maybe he played one or two games at centre-half, something like he that. He barely had. He played there in pre-season. He played a game in pre-season. Was it against Rangers? Yeah, it was. And then Arsene Wenger made the decision in a summer in which I think we only signed Jens Lehmann and Gail Clichy. Gail Clichy was 16 or 17 at the time. We were probably all screaming for Philippe Mexes. Probably. Where is Philippe Mexes? Bring us Mexes, Wenger, you idiot. <laughs> you know, exactly. It was that kind of thing. But that's a big decision to make. But he lent into the talent and the potential. And obviously, it was a great decision. It turned out to be a brilliant decision. Um, I just wonder if at some point, when it comes to Smith, Rowe and Saka, those are decisions that you might have to make which may not please people who want more signings, if that makes sense. Yeah. And Smith, by the way, saying Smith Rowe's going to be our number 10, starting number 10 next season, would be a lot less of a risk than the Torre decision. I mean, yeah. he's he's played six months of football in and around that area of the pitch and done very, very well. Um, there's also the fact that, you know, there's interest in the player from elsewhere. Um, he wants a nice big new contracts to kind of put that to bed. So if you're going to invest substantially in his wages, mm. you want to see that reflected in his playing time. I I, um, I really, really started the window being like, yeah, we've got to have a new number 10. And it's got to be a, a star, you know, so mm. we can build a team around. And I would still like that. But I am open to the idea that if Arsenal, if Arteta and Edu decide, actually it's, it's going to be Smith Rowe, and we buy someone who is starts out as the backup to Smith Rowe or an alternative option rather than being head and shoulders above him in terms of status and price tag and all those things. If, if that's what they feel is right, I would be able to make my peace with that for sure. Yeah, I mean, look, I want a signing in that area as well. Absolutely. I'd, I'd like to see it. I think everybody would. But, you know, how do you, how do you balance the clamour for we must sign... Smith Rowe to a new contract immediately to ward off the yeah. evil villains of Aston Villa because this kid is going to be the next big thing for, you know, for Arsenal. We've got to give him a five-year deal. Actually, make it a 12-year deal. You know, go go all in on this kid and then say, well, we need to bring in a player who, because of the transfer fee, people will say, well, he has to play. You know what I mean? So it is a balancing act. It yeah. is a balancing act. So... Uh, interesting, yeah. I'd be very interested to see what happens with that position. Okay, here is one. I've got two very quick ones. Uh, Apnea Boy, who's at Oxomoron. Hopefully he sleeps okay, that guy. Morning, gents. Surely the system Arteta intends to play in the coming seasons determines the type of players we need to buy. Has Arteta ever publicly declared his favourite system? If so, what is it? He hasn't, but he has alluded very strongly to four three three. Yeah, I think. I think he has said pretty much Maybe outright. Maybe he did say that explicitly. Yeah. yeah, and I don't know if we're yet in a position for that to be the system. But I think the players that we buy, I think there will be a desire for them to fit into that system as well as a four two three one or whatever we played for the majority of last year. Mm. I think multifunctionality will appeal, um, but you know, I've, I think long term four three three is the goal. Uh, and again, Smith Rowe is kind of a a great option because he can play in that. Mm. You know, he can play as a kind of slightly deeper number eight player. Um, not that many attacking midfielders have that capacity to do both in that way. And yeah, I think that I think that when they signed Thomas Partey, they did so partly thinking that four three three was something within his mm. wheelhouse. And you'd like to think that when they kind of do a big diagram in the technical director's office of players they want to sign, um, that's something they're bearing in mind, right? Surely yeah, it has to be. I think so. Like, I, th I think Arteta did say that, you know, to, to he wants to play 4-3-3, but he said we lack the specificity in certain positions to do that. So if that is his ultimate goal, then it's, maybe it's not something that he can achieve in one window. It might take 
another couple of windows, um, you know, if he's still in the job to get that done. But if that's what he's if that's what he really wants and he's got confidence in his ability to implement that system, then at least some of the players within this window have to be part of of that vision, right? So mm -hmm. that's why I, I think we said this more than once is that we all want to see new signings. We all know why we want to see new signings. The, the club needs them, the team needs them, et cetera, et cetera. But the signings we make are going to be fascinating from the point of view of, you know, us trying to figure out what's going to happen tactically and positionally and formationally next season. Yep. Yep. Okay, final one. Definitely. I give it to you. Um, it comes from Beardy McBeardface, who says, <laughs> is the Smith the best nickname since the Jeff? And if people don't know the context of this, Nuno Tavares was asked in his interview with, with Arsenal.com, in which he conducted in pretty good English, it has to be said, mm -hmm. what Arsenal players he liked. And he said he, he really likes the Smith Emil Smith Rowe because he's of the same age, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so yeah, I like that nickname a lot. I mean, yeah. to be honest, I've I've had probably enough of variations on comparisons to Kevin De Bruyne. So yeah, I, I, I'm more than happy to embrace a new nickname. The Smith feels quite uh, unique and a worthy successor to the Jeff yeah. the nickname stakes. I what like it. Think? I like it. It's quite endearing, isn't it? You know, the Smith. I think that's one that might follow uh, Emil around. And if he is a The Smith, I hope he's Johnny Marr and not that wanker Marcy. Right. Um, <laughs> let's leave it there. With that. <laughs> let's leave it there. James, whatever happens uh, tonight, good luck to you. Uh, good Thank luck to you. both teams. May the best team win. I hope you have a great night uh, anyway. And we will chat again in the morning where, regardless of what happens, I suspect you could be the one with the hangover. I fear that's almost <laughs> certain. But yeah, let's see how let's see how, how bad it is in the morning. All right, listen uh, to everybody. Thank you very much indeed for listening, subscribing and all the rest. We will talk to you again in the morning. Enjoy the game later and we'll catch you on the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>